I get to spend the next 15 minutes telling you about something that inspires me every single day. And that is 3.8 billion years worth of natural innovation, which is happening long before we got here, is happening outside this room right now, and will continue to happen long after we are here. And at Appeal, we use the natural world as an inspiration for the technology that we're developing. But more broadly, I believe that nature is a very practical example of ways that we can build systems and interact with the natural world in ways that work with the natural world and not ways that work against the natural world. Um, the, the, the scale of natural innovation is stunning, um, both from the very grand to the, the very small. Uh, let's take a look at a couple of examples that, that always blow my mind when I think about this. The most biodiverse climate on this planet is the Amazon River Basin. And you might be surprised to know, at least I was surprised to find out, that you can trace the origins of this biodiversity to the fertility of the soil, which is a result of all of the nutrients which are being swept all the way across the Atlantic Ocean from, from the Sahara Desert. Um, you'll see that uh, show here. And the scale of this is massive. Every single year, the amount of land mass which is whipped across these whipped from the continents across the ocean is greater than all of the total fertilizer which we're using in order to support our current agricultural production. But we can zoom in and see the same level of elegance and beauty if we look inside of a single, single blade of grass. Uh, this cross section, which is shown here, is representing uh, these little building blocks. They, they look like uh, little bricks in a wall, but in fact, these are individual cells inside of a blade of grass. And these little floating green spheres that you see are little floating solar power stations, which the cells are using symbiotically to generate the fuel that they need to grow. And if they need to produce more fuel, they make more of these. And if they need less, they deconstruct them and they use those materials again and again. But these innovations didn't happen overnight. This has taken 3. billion years since the, the start and the evolution of, of life on Earth. And the way that we are going to be able to, to build new things, uh, we believe, is not by trying to come up with entirely new solutions on our own, but by rather figuring out how to ask nature the questions which it has already spent, it's already got a 3.8 billion year head start on trying to answer these, these questions. And so let's look at a couple of examples um, and areas where we urgently need to ask nature questions. And these are in some of our most polluting industries. And if we look at these industries and we look at the way that these industries operate, it's these industries which operate most apart from the way that the natural world has started to solve these problems. So, so let's, let's dive in and look at a few of these. Um, this butterfly has spent 60 million years figuring out an environmentally friendly way to attract a mate. Now, if we look at this at first, we might think, wow, this butterfly has really developed a very beautiful dye, uh, which it can use to, to generate this, this color. Um, but it's not until we zoom in and we look at the wing itself in very fine detail that we see that it's actually the same material the butterfly is using to build its otherwise colorless exoskeleton by patterning this material in a very special way that it's evolved over millions of years. It's found a way to simply reflect only blue light. There's no pigment involved. If we were to gr grind up the wing of this butterfly, we would find no color. So imagine an industry in which we no longer needed to dye clothing and the water and energy use required to do that. Imagine we could use the same materials and simply reflect the colors uh, that were, happened to be in fashion. You might see a shark when you see this photo. Uh, another way to think about this is this is a machine which has been innovating in ma marine transport for the last 400 million years. Now, if you give nature enough time and you give it millions and millions of years to try to solve a problem, it finds a very, very efficient solution. Now, the solution that the shark has developed is revealed when we again look at its skin. The skin of the shark 
is one of the most advanced ways to minimize drag in the water, which minimizes energy use during transportation, and simultaneously has the effect of being self-cleaning. Now, the shark accomplishes this trick by using a very complicated hierarchical structure, which includes length scales of features across more than three orders of magnitude at the little length scales that it needs to piece this together. Imagine then that we were able to use that shark skin and apply it to all the marine transport vessels on this planet. Imagine the efficiencies we could gain. Um, or look at an example. This is probably the one that I get most excited about when I think about personally. Uh, the fact that there are plants on this planet outside that have found a way to take the sun's energy and to turn it into chemical fuel, which is ultimately being used to produce all of the biological mass on this planet, and they're doing it in a very clever way. By using photosynthesis, and we're going to set aside that beautiful innovation for a second, plants have found a way to use a proton gradient, which is set up inside the plant as a result of the sun, and use these little molecular rotors. And the way that they work is they actually grab spent fuel that's floating around inside the cells. They grab the pieces of spent fuel, and they physically bring them together and hold them together until they link back up. And once they link back up, the cell can then use that energy again. And this is happening right now in every single one of your bodies. Every single day, you turn over the same mass of this fuel as your body weighs. Imagine we built a system in which you had to eat your body weight every single day. That's not the way that nature develops these solutions. Now, Imagine a world in which the fuel source that we as humanity utilized was one in which we used the fuel, we collected the fuel, we returned it to its original state, and then we reused it again. That's the type of system that nature would build. Or one of my other favorites, uh, one that's evolved specifically for us. Fruit co-evolved with different animals because it was so delicious that the animals would eat it and they would help propagate it. They would help spread its seeds. The, the challenge, however, is that we have only co-evolved with particular fruit types for a really short period in, in, in history. And although they've developed so that we're going to help spread them around, um, they don't necessarily have the, the characteristics that we would want in today's food system. But they have figured out something really special. And that happened when they transferred out of water and onto land. When plants evolved out of water and onto land, the evolutionary adaptation which allowed them to do this was the formation of this thin polymeric barrier around the outside of the plant. Prior to this thin polymeric barrier, which is referred to as cutin, when the plant moved onto land, it dried out very rapidly because it wasn't able to resist the desiccative stress of the ambient environment. And so when the plant developed this adaptation, it was so important that it's been evolutionarily conserved between species. So every surface of a plant that you see growing above the surface of the earth is covered with this thin barrier. And this is where we have been focusing at Appeal. Again, the fruit, everyone has had the experience of a strawberry going bad in the refrigerator. And the reason for this is because the fruit is slowly losing moisture and it's oxidizing. Processes which are caused by diffusion of water out of the fruit and oxygen into the fruit. And so we at Appeal have found a way to take the molecules from the parts of the plant that you're not eating, the same materials, and to recycle them into a barrier which we apply to the outside of the parts of the plant which you are eating. And by doing so, we can have a dramatic impact. We can leverage 3.8 billion years to add a couple days, but this is something that we all want in our refrigerators. You've all had this happen. Once the fruit loses moisture and desiccates, it's gone. By reducing that desiccation, the fruit lasts dramatically longer. The joke with the avocado, not now, not now, not now, now, too late. With this technology, we can make that joke no longer funny. I love the citrus example. Uh, the inspiration for our name of our company, Appeal, comes from the idea that fruit with appeal has a much longer shelf life than fruit without appeal. Um, now fruit uh, with our appeal uh, lasts as long as citrus can. If we solve perishability, 
we can solve trillions of dollars of losses that are happening every single year. If we relax this idea of perishability, we can open up access to new markets. Whether it's smallholder farmers in a remote region of Kenya that may not have access to a city center where someone's gonna be willing to pay them for what they're growing, or a new highly productive production region like Peru, which may now be able to gain access to the Asian market for the first time. Or experience things like this. Uh, this is a caviar line. Many of you have probably never seen this before. It's natively from Australia. And the reason that you haven't seen it is because it has an extremely short shelf life. It only lasts about seven days. But with nature's technology, we can make this product commercially viable. 25 days this can last, and now you're gonna be able to pick this up in your grocery stores. We're gonna add a lot more people to this planet in the next 30 years. And if we continue to do things using the systems that humans have evolved, we're gonna need 70% more food, and we're gonna need 55% more fresh water. Now, we could go try to find a second Earth, and there are people trying to do this. Or we could do what humans have always done, and we can, be, we can choose to be defined by the materials which we have available to us. As a scientist and a material scientist, I'm always motivated by the fact that when historians have looked back in human history, the way that they have defined the progress of human development has been according to the tools that we have available to us. Think back to school, remember the Stone Age, remember the Bronze Age, remember the Iron Age, and where we're seated now in the Silicon Age. Now that we have the tools to peer into the natural world, to identify those molecules which nature has been using and reusing and recycling again and again since the beginning of life on this earth, when historians look back on the age that we're entering now, if we choose to be part of the system and not apart from the system, what will they call this age? We believe that by making very small changes and integrating ourselves into the system today, we have a dramatic opportunity to have an incredible impact on our future.